Welcome to Tough Talk. I'm your host, Paul Terrace, and today my guest is Christine Bonds, former candidate for the 11th Congressional District. Welcome, Christine. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. So, uh, for those who may not know, your father was Bill Bonds. Yes. Uh, a Detroit News anchor icon for many years. How was that growing up as his daughter? <laughs> it was fantastic. It yeah. was a blast, yeah. My father, um, he, above anything else, really loved people. And he had a great sense of understanding someone if he just met them. And he really knew his kids very well. He knew things about each kid that we didn't necessarily know about ourselves. Um, he had a fantastic sense of humor. He liked to read a lot. I uh, loved sports, loved music, so, you know, there were four kids, and um, it was a busy house. It was, a, you know, I, an idyllic childhood living on a lake, and uh, it was a lot of fun. So where of the four children, were you the oldest, middle, or? So I am the baby, but I have a twin. Oh. So my sister Mary is my twin, um, and then it was John, who's a year older, and then my eldest sister Joan. Um, she was, um, you know, killed many years ago. But, oh, um, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do you have any uh, interesting stories about your father? There's tons of stories <laughs> about my dad. Um, you know, I, I really feel that he, he and my mom complemented each other so well. And, and it was really important to... Um, you know, come from a family that um, knew what it was to work hard and to love what you do. And he always said, be yourself. That's enough, just be yourself. And of course, feeling very loved. Um, but he, you know, he was my dad to me. And so it was very natural because he, I mean, he started as a reporter on the street, you know. Um, but as his career um, grew and, you know, his role changed, he, he never changed really in terms of um, who he was. And uh, again, he was one of the kindest men that, that I've ever known. And um, he really wanted his family to be happy. I mean, that was really important to him. Um, he certainly had his struggles and so forth. But, you know, looking back, we were so taken care of. We were so loved. And um, it, it, was, it was a really great foundation once I became an adult. I was, we're all very autonomous and, and happy and we get along. And so um, there's a lot to be said for, you know, what he brought to the table as a, as a family man, as a father. Well, I think uh, being yourself showed through on the camera, and Aww. that's probably why he was, you know, so mm -hmm. well loved in the Detroit area. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, did you have any challenges? I mean, were there people that were mean to you because your father was? Yeah, kids could be really mean. They could, and he, you know, had struggles early on in terms of um, drinking and so forth, and that was something that as a kid you don't really understand all the time. Um, and kids could be mean. They could say mean, mean things. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, as a family, you really, you work through it. And um, thankfully, um, you know, I had um, two parents that really again, made us um, a priority in terms of being taken care of. And um, it really um, was okay at the end of the day, you know. It was, it was actually a great childhood. <laughs> okay. Um, because, you know, your father was who, who he was, um, did you have any uh, special opportunities that you'd like to share there with us? There were a lot of opportunities. It was like you could walk into a restaurant and 
you know, get seated right away. I always say that this, that, that folks treat the wrong people. It's like he didn't have to have his meal not, you know, paid for by himself. <laughs> um, it was being able to go to a sports event and having great seats, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the opportunity to meet a lot of different people. I mean, when he held the town hall for uh, former President Clinton, um, that was a really, um, really engaging experience for me. You know, I was in my 30s, and it was, it was a very big deal. It was the first time that that had happened with the president, and um, you know, it took place at Channel 7, and um, it was, you know, a very enlightening experience to be in the presence of the president of the United States. Walked right up to me. Of course, my dad was not shy, and he said, <laughs> "President Clinton, if this were Chelsea, you know, I'd want you to say hello and so forth." And I was tongue-tied. I was just didn't know what to say. Um, so, of course, it came with its own perks and so forth, which were, you know, I think we never took for granted. It was, it was truly gifts. Well, that sounds like you had a great uh, childhood yeah. there. So, I, I know everybody in Detroit uh, misses your father on Aww, television. Oh, that's so. so nice to hear. Thank you. He's he's very easy to miss. So, um, you you were a candidate for the eleventh congressional district. Mm -hmm. um, why did you decide to run for that office? I thought I would do a really good job. I care about Michigan, I care about my district, and I decided in January to run. It's a very big deal, as you know, to run for any office. Um, in this case, I felt like it would certainly be a life-changing event. Um, and I, I really feel passionate about two uh, points of interest, and that is the opioid epidemic and where we're going to be as a state, as a community, relative to the automotive landscape. I feel that we're at another time where we have to get it right in terms of autonomous vehicles. Um, it's now, you know, it's going to be a trillion dollar industry. It's a global industry. And for the first time, um, we are not manufacturing the most cars in the United States. Um, the imports are now manufacturing more cars. So what's great for the United States is not all, not necessarily great for Michigan, uh, and so those those two subjects were really my driving force to run uh, for office. Okay, um, is there a reason the opioids uh, epidemic is such an important issue to you? Yes, we lost our beloved, my stepson, um, my husband's son, it was his eldest son, to um, a fatal overdose oh. about four and a half years ago. I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you. And um, it was a very traumatic, life-changing event. I'm certainly not um, unaware of addiction. You know, I. My family has struggled, struggled with addiction and so forth. And I feel that the crisis just kept growing and growing. Like when I started looking at the numbers, um, I, it, it was just unbelievable to me that no one was truly taking charge. We could cut this epidemic in half simply by following the CDC guidelines that have been put forth in terms of recommending opioid drugs to patients. Um, and so we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. We can really use common sense tactics and approaches to helping solve this. And um, I don't have any regrets. I'm really glad that I, I, I did it. And I, in my heart of hearts, want to be the voice, the face, um, and the solution. Uh, to to this epidemic. Okay. Um, now, do you, do you think um, the problem? Well, what is the problem of the opioids? Like, how do people get hooked on it? Is it uh, they're using a prescription and then feel the need to continue, or is it people just buying things off the street? Oh, well, it's both. Okay. And um, I want to focus on the demand side. I think already we've seen some really nice changes relative to the supply side, but the demand side is about prevention, prevention, prevention. 
It's educating folks, um, you know, putting together a, 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 an awareness campaign um, to, to really send out that message that don't even get hooked on it in the first place. You know, I, I just went to a funeral a couple of weeks ago, a young man OD, and he found the medicine in his grandfather's closet. Or not closet, but his his um, you know medicine, medicine chest. Cabinet, yeah. So it's it's trying to close the loop on on little um, you know areas where um, we can successfully um, take away the opportunity for kids to even get into a medic medicine cabinet and take you know such drugs. Um, and it's it's truly raising the awareness and taking away the stigma still of addiction. It's a family disease. It's not just, you know, the addict who's in trouble. The family really needs to understand that it's a progressive disease. Um, if, if I had a family member who is suffering from, you know, such an addiction, I would have something on the back end to make sure that I could revive them if they were to OD. You know, it's it's be, it's it's giving first responders the you know antidote to someone who's just OD. That should be just as available in a family home as a fire extinguisher. It's these kinds of um, common sense, tactical um, ideas that we can start implementing within our communities to to really um, make sure the numbers go down. And we have to be accountable in terms of. Um, you know, what we're putting forth. It's not going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars. It's not like we have to, you know, um, find a cure for cancer or MS. We have enough research to understand addiction and to know that if we cut it off, especially for the younger adults, then, you know, right there we're saving a large portion of, of lives. Saving one life is, is that's enough. Do you th do people know when somebody is an addict, or are these people like hiding it and are in the shadows? So part of the addiction is denial, and um, so no. Sometimes family members don't know that they have someone suffering from such an addiction, um, and it's not until you really kind of look at some of the behavior. Um, that you can start to identify, you know, some areas of concern, um, and it's progressive again. So, you know, someone can very, um, you know, honestly start out thinking, hey, I, you know, this is a fun drug to take or whatever, and then lo and behold, it grabs them. I mean, uh, you know, the top two causes for younger adults is oral surgery and sports injuries. You know, I have a friend who two weeks ago hurt her foot. She was in the hospital for two days, and all she was taking was Tylenol, and when they released her, she had a prescription for, ox for Oxy for 10 days. And so again, it's, it's and sh she called me and she said, What's, why was I prescribed this? Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to, again, you know, she was smart enough to know I don't need it, I'm not gonna take it, I'm not even gonna have it filled, right? So, but, you know, multiply that by a hundred times or a thousand times across the country, and that shouldn't be happening. You know, if we were just to abide by the protocol that's already been established, um, we, would, we would be saving lives. Every, every 12 and a half minutes, someone is ODing fatally from, from opioids. Now, you mentioned um, having a the injection to revive somebody from an overdose. Um, what 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 is that injection? Well, the brand is Narcan. Okay. Um, and there's you know a, var a variety that you can choose from, but it's it's you know it needs to be taken seriously too. But it is a safe way um, to revive someone until the medical folks arrive and um, are able to you know successfully look at them and take them to the hospital and so on. But it is, it's a lifesaver. It does save lives. Okay. Um, now, you know, I, I previously mentioned you were running for Congress. Um, what happened that you are no longer running for Congress? It was the technicalities relative to the signatures. So we, you know, there's um, a certain amount of signatures that you must get within your district. 
and the 11th district is, is quite large. I mean, it's very, you know, it's all over the place. Um, and, um, you know, we hired consultants. I mean, this was something that we opened up to, you know, folks that we trust who have, have gone down this road before and so forth. And unfortunately, um, there were some techni technicalities once we um, handed over um, the sheets and the signatures to the folks in Lansing. And it was quite disappointing, to say the least. Uh, so you, you know, you live and learn. And I would certainly um, take what I learned uh, onto my next journey and next step. <laughs> okay. Um, do you think um, the board of canvassers were were right in their determination of invalidating certain signatures, or? Yes, I think they're. I think they're fair. I actually went to Lansing and defended myself in front of the board of directors. Uh, and I'm all about honoring processes that are in place. They're in place for a reason. Um, I think that, you know, if I, when I drilled deeper, I understood that it was, you know, the folks that I put my trust in to get, to get the job done uh, didn't necessarily, um, you know, go through everything with a, uh, a magnifying glass, which should have happened. I mean, it's every, there are so many different moving parts to running a campaign, as you all know. And, um, you know, this particular um, uh, angle was um, just, it was, a, it was a misstep. It was just, it was, you know, if someone had really zoned in and understood that everything has to be perfect. There can be no I's or T's not crossed or dotted. Um, it wouldn't have been a problem. So, unfortunately, that cost me the, the ability to carry on. <laughs> okay. Um, do you think sometime in the future you may be running for Congress again? I think that I will be running again. Okay. I'm not sure if I can say necessarily for Congress, but I think I will be running again. Okay. And. Uh, I, I assume you're going to be more cautious on collecting signatures in the future, if, mm -hmm. if need be. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I, I've heard that's, uh, but you know, not only in your campaign but in others that uh, where you do need to collect signatures, it's a very important part. And sometimes when you do hire companies, they let you down, and then at, at least yours submitted the necessary number or more than oh, the yeah. number, mm -hmm. but I've heard stories where you assume they're doing it and then they don't even have, you know, half the number they're supposed to have and so campaigns are s scrambling to get the signatures at the last minute. And Yeah, and you don't, I mean, you don't know what you don't know, right? And so this was my, you know, first experience into this whole arena. And you have to delegate. I mean, there's no way you cannot be delegating certain tasks and so forth. And um, it happens quickly. I mean, you think you have all this time to meet certain deadlines, but you really don't. I mean, you're still maintaining your regular life, working and so forth. And so um, I, I, you know, I learned it and, um, it was, it was, it was very disappointing. I do have to say because it's, it sounds so simple. Ah, just get a thousand signatures, and there was a lot more to it. There was a lot more to it. Okay. Now, now you mentioned the second uh, uh, issue that was very important, making uh, Michigan the uh, autonomous capital of the U.S. or world. Um, what steps do you think? Uh, should be taken to make sure Michigan is that? That's a really great question. Um, I think that uh, I'd like to see the domestic OEMs, Chrysler, GM, Fiat, Chrysler, GM, Ford come together, um, not as a company, but certainly come together relative to their leaders um, to ensure that some way, somehow, we capitalize on uh, the best technologies out there. Um, all of them are spending millions of dollars investing 
in autonomous vehicles. And quite frankly, a lot of folks don't realize this, but they're already driving cars that have uh, autonomous capabilities. And what I mean by that is it's truly having eyes uh, you know, uh, surrounding your whole car. It's, they're going to actually be safer cars to drive. They really will be. And in, I bet 15, 20 years, um, everyone will be in an autonomous vehicle. Um, but it's, it's everyone's vying for first place. And so what does that mean for Michigan? Um, you know, is it, is it um, being able to, um, you know, come up with, um, you know, certain vehicles that um, have uh, new technologies that the imports won't be allowed to have? Um, is there a way that we can guarantee for like the first five years a certain percentage of market share? Um, I don't know what that looks like yet, but I think that we have to be really strategic in terms of how we handle um, autonomous vehicles, what that means for our communities, um, certainly for the millennials, they're, they're not necessarily buying cars. You know, mobility has changed that. It's, it's being able to get into a Lyft or an Uber. Um, so um, I think that we're going to start to see a decline even in sales of vehicles. Um, and again, what does that mean for Detroit? Um, yeah, well, you, you know, I, I'm curious that, uh, you know, there seems to be uh, every couple of years a revival in this uh, um, transit authority mm -hmm. to, you know, uh, get, get buses and light rail to move people around metropolitan Detroit. And it just seems to me if we really want to be the leader, why don't we jump ahead and go to, you know, encourage instead of investing in, you know, these buses that cost so much money, invest in driverless uh, autonomous vehicles through Uber or Lyft where it'll take you from, you know, your home to work, your home to, you know, shopping, whatever, mm -hmm. and it's door to door, you know, and wouldn't that be a better uh, uh, use of our tax dollars mm -hmm. to invest in, in that than in old technology like buses and light rail. Right. Well, I believe Dan Gilbert's already doing that in, in downtown, is that he has um, some autonomous vehicles that are um, now, um, you know, they, they're, the, his employees are using them, you know, to get from point A to point B. Um, so to your point, yeah, that does make a lot of sense. And it's going to be, I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot to figure out. You know, then we have to figure out where does auto insurance play in this. But I think there will come a time where they'll look at us and be like, well, were you self-driving or were you driving? And there's going to be a difference in terms of coverage. Um, that's, that's far out, like, you know. But um, I think that we're at that apex moment where it's going to forever be changed. And it'll take a while. I mean, they can't force people who are driving older cars not to, you know, drive those cars. But um, I think for Michigan, um, I think that we have a great opportunity to be the leaders of the pack. And um, we're going to have to, we're really going to have to get all the great minds in one room to figure out how best to move the technologies forward. Um, to you know, apply that to consumers and certainly the millennials, and um, and how that's going to change what Michigan looks like. You know, how how can we bring in um, new companies, and and it's still going to be tied to the automotive sector, just in a different way. Okay, now you were just appointed to. Um the Opioid Task Force. Mm -hmm. So tell us about what that task force is all about. Happy to. So relative to Michigan, it's really putting on the boots of a leader and laying out an agenda and a strategy. And it's, it's going to be prevention, treatment, and, and rescue. 
And like I said earlier, um, we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. It's not like we have to have hundreds of millions of dollars to solve this epidemic. We could, again, cut it in half by simply complying by the CDC guidelines relative to dispensing opioids. Uh, it's being very mindful to patients who do need to use opioids for chronic pain. Um, we want to make sure that they know that we're not taking those away from them, that they are absolutely um, a priority as well to make sure that they're taken care of. It's raising awareness. It is raising awareness in families and in our, communi in our communities. And um, it's, we have budget for it. I mean, when I was in Washington last January, I was in front of Paul Ryan's team and I said, look, we have not seen any money for this epidemic. What is on your agenda? And thankfully, the president added it to his State of the Union address, and $6 billion was allocated for the next two years relative to the nation. So we have a number now that we can work with in Michigan. And like I said, it's going to be common sense tactics, a branding awareness. It's really a negative branding awareness campaign. Um, and then it's, it's really closing the loops on, on, on how we can, again, prevent one life to no matter how many lives we can save. Laws are now being passed. There was Jesse's law that was just passed and that was a situation where this young woman was an addict and um, she was clean and she, her parents um, were um, telling the doctors after she had just had an operation, look, there's addiction that runs in our family. Please don't prescribe her any hard drugs. And lo and behold, that message did not get to the doctor. She was sent home with, you know, opioid-based um, drugs, and and she is no longer with us. Mm -hmm. So it's closing the loop on those kinds of little scenarios that are going to make a great difference. Okay. So how much uh, is Michigan getting from the federal government? Well, I mean, I can give you a range, but it's it's like in the seventy. It, it's like in the seventy million dollar mark. Okay. And is that annual or uh, for the two-year period? I most likely is going to be for the two-year period. Okay. Now, does Michigan have to match any of those funds, or is we're ironing out those details, quite frankly? Okay. Okay. Well, we're out of time, so I want to thank you so much for taking time to be a guest on my show. Absolute pleasure. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Christine.